the House of Commons, I announced an important decision of the government on the subject of television, that latest miracle of scientific achievement which is now arousing so much interest. And today, I have been able to announce that the government have approved the scheme and that steps will be taken to carry it into effect. In 1936, no one anywhere in the world had done television. Today, I mean, we take for granted it's wallpaper people switch on. In 36, it was completely new, completely unknown, and how to do it. No one told us what to do. We just had our make up our everything as we went along. No one had got any forms, no one had got any costs, no one knew about expenses or anything like that. I think the BBC or I, I think both of us thought it prudent to say to any chap, uh, look, uh, um, uh, this will mean giving up our job in sound broadcasting, and if television is a flop, you'd have to go back to sound broadcasting. Of course, you wouldn't be sacked, but you'd have to sort of go back after disappointment. Are you willing to take the risk? He said, well, there wasn't one that said no. It was all a totally new and very exciting adventure. The selection of a site for the first television station presented many difficulties of which the public know little. Eventually, the Alexandra Palace was chosen. This playground of northeast London was a relic of Victorian times. It is, as you see, decorated in the style of the period and stands in a park of almost 200 acres, 350 feet above sea level, commanding a wonderful view over London. It has been used for many years past as a setting for concerts, exhibitions, and circuses. In November 1935, the work of reconstruction was begun on the southeast wing. To convert the old palace into the headquarters of the latest miracle in electrical communication, complete reconstruction... One day in August 1936, we were all sent for into the concert hall, the broadcasting house, and Gerald Cock, who had just been appointed director of television, told us all our jobs. And uh, he said, now I want to make it absolutely clear, you won't have to do any programs for four months, so you've got plenty of time to acclimatize yourself because nobody's ever produced a television program in the world, so nobody can say they know anything about it because they don't. So we all left Broadcasting House and we piled into cars and we went out there and I went up in the lift to the third floor and there was a phone in the corner and the phone was going, blazing away. So with some trepidation I crossed the room, picked up the phone and there he was, Gerald Cox, <laughs> he said, Cecil, wash out everything I said, everything has changed. The radio industry can't sell the stands. Radio Olympia is a dead failure, and uh, they say television can save it. So he said, now don't muck about. I want you to know that television starts in nine days' time. So get on with it. Engineers stand by in the control room. The levels are set. Switches are thrown. Generators begin to turn. The water flows through to the transmitter valves. The valve filaments begin to glow. The lights in the studios come up on the dimmers. 
the producer is waiting at his microphone to speak his last word to the artist. The controllers are ready on vision and sound. The vision and sound are on. The station goes on the air. Hello, Radio Olympia. This is direct television from the studios at Alexander Palace. And now you're going to see and hear someone you know well, Miss Helen Mackay. So I got the staff together, and as I was the senior man, I explained the situation to them. I said, we haven't got the four months. We've got nine days. So now we're going to get on with it. Who wants to produce the first program? No one did. So I said, I am the senior man. No one has had any experience, so I take this on. I am the producer. Now, who is going to help? And then everybody wanted to help. Peter Bax, who was head of design, put on a white coat and was one of the studio men on the floor. George Moore Farrell did the same. He said, I'd like to be your assistant. So everybody buckled to, and we had this uh, cooperative thing that we would produce this first program. Then I got on to Ronnie Hill, who was a popular composer at the time, and I said, we want a new song to open the whole thing with. And he thought for a little while, and he came up with this title, Here's Looking at... And it's still unique, because no one really has ever done 20 programs live. We did it twice a day for 10 days, from Alexandra Palace to the radio show at Radio Olympia. Now, cameras, please, here are the instructions. We're using all three of you in this scene. Number one, I want you back most of the time for a postcard effect, unless I ask you to go into a close-up. Number three, on the low tripod, down for the stunt shots. And number two, you start on the caption, keep screwed up high, and after the first caption, turn, turn and dolly onto the set. It, it wasn't like the vast corporation or the other companies today. But really, only seemed to be a few dozen people, engineers and technicians and so on. And all of them were absolutely quivering with excitement at this new toy, I was going to say, that they were playing with. Now, we're on you one, we're mixing to two. We're using both of you at this moment. There is a spirit of total dedication. And nobody uh, thought of it just as another job. They thought of it as a privilege. Um, they like to be paid, right? but of course they... <laughs> I think many of them would be prepared to do it for nothing. Oh dear. It was a wonderful time. Broadcasting House, who hated paying out any money for us at all, wanted us to start very small, do an occasional program, and so on. And I thought this was absolute nonsense. Television would fail if we didn't open as big as we could, as if we'd been running for years, and really have solid schedules filled the whole time. I would remind viewers that this is a special film survey of some of television's program activities. It is coming to you over the air, not from the studio's direct, but from film, and is being transmitted in the same way as if it were a newsreel. Well, you know, I never applied for television. It really came about because I went to a cocktail party and met Gerald Cock, who was the head man on television eventually, and he said, are you going to join us and fascinate the girls? And I said, love to, but I haven't been asked yet, so frankly, I'm quite happy doing what I do. And he said, are you sure about that? And I said, absolutely. End of story. And. Uh, a few months later, I found my ugly mug staring at me out of the Daily Mail, saying, television the donor is found. And it was me. I looked a second time, and it had my name on it. And who on earth found that idea, I don't know. But it came out, and I was accused by everybody of talking to somebody in the press to get the job and one thing another. But I assure you, and I promise you to this day, I never did anything about it at all. 
I was known from then on as the Adonis of television until they got used to seeing me. You know, well, that's right. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to show you one of the visitors in our series of outside broadcasts, Golfers in Action. Our visitor on this occasion is C.A. Whitcomb, who, as most of you know, captained the English Ryder Cup team last year, 1936. He's going to demonstrate various shots, and he's going to start off with a drive. So now let's get on with the show. Before you actually drive, I'd like you to demonstrate to viewers the difference between the grip used by yourself and your brother, which I believe is known as the interlocking grip, and the ordinary overlapping grip. Our grip, we turn the interlock. That is, you interlock the two fingers, placing our thumbs around the shaft. Whereas, as you know, the overlap is the little finger of the right hand overlapping the first finger of the left hand and the thumbs down the shaft. Yes, quite. Well, perhaps you'd like to drive for us so that we can see just how far it goes. I know it goes a long way. A beauty. Since the opening of the television service in November 1936, the programs transmitted have covered a wide range of entertainment and interest. A great part of the time has been given to light entertainment, in which many cabaret and variety artists have been used. Before passing on to show you some of the artists and speakers as they appeared in the studio, we show you the television orchestra with its conductor, Hyam Greenbaum. Ladies and gentlemen, the television orchestra. <laughs> Fontaine, who was very young then, all the Russian ballet, the big bands like Jack Payne and Jack Hilton, Dickie Murdoch, Arthur Lasky, and basically, however well established they were as artists, they were nervous of the new medium. Because there wasn't a second chance. If they made a mistake on transmission, that went out over the air, and the artist didn't like that. And part of my job, really, as well as announcing, was to calm them down and make them feel at home and relaxed. I spent a lot of my youth up here. And I love it, and I love coming back. You know, it's fun. I'll demonstrate your methods on my hands, Dr. Charlotte Fowles. With greatest pleasure. But you must remember that I'm a scientist, and a proper analysis takes us more than one hour, so I can only give some general indication. I consider your hand dominated, and your personality dominated by the zone of instinct. I imagine that you could find your way alone in the dark. Yes, I can. It's me. I can't believe it. I can't believe I look quite a sinister. As a matter of fact, I used to, used to take part in OBs quite a lot. And I used to go down to the farm, which was fun. And, you know, it was also a new experience in anything to get away from the studios. I used to get so fed up with standing in front of the camera in the studios and anything to get outside. So this I enjoyed very much indeed. But I'd like to see the shot of it here of, of milking the cow, because I, I'm not terribly fond of cows. There we are, you see, being frightfully brave, really. Most difficult thing in the world to do, because if they don't like you, they just won't give you any milk. And she didn't like me. I just sort of sat there pulling away and nothing happened. And smoking, as usual, you see, isn't that awful to be smoking on the screen like that? I still do it. I became a sort of stunt girl because um, it was a good thing. Really, one of the reasons I think I was allowed to do it so much was that people who got used to me in the studio, and then when we started doing outside broadcasts, they thought it was a good thing to have somebody outside that they knew. And anyway, I enjoyed doing it all. I did a lot of stunts and things. And I became known as a sort of pearl ride of television. I went up in helicopters and did trick riding with the Royal Corps of Signals and played tennis in the center court of Wimbledon. But it was all really, you know, to show how much outside broadcasts were progressing. The coronation of King George VI and the present Queen Elizabeth the Mother was due on the May the 12th, 1937. And it was suggested that we, without having any opportunity to build up to this gradually in a set of broadcasts of ever increasing uh, severity, should just do this thing. And 
It is one of the boldest processions the BBC ever made. The first outside broadcast was of the coronation procession on the 12th of May, 1937. Now comes the procession of state coaches with the representatives of empire and the prime minister. Queen Mary, the state coach. Eight magnificent greys drawing on that almost unbelievable state coach with their majesties, the king and queen. The link with the main transmitter can be either by means of a special high frequency cable, which can be tapped almost anywhere in the west end of London, or when the outside broadcast unit is not on the cable roof, by means of a mobile transmitter the signals of which are fed to a transmitting aerial mounted on an extendable fire escape. This is only a film, but our actual broadcasts are live. We take you to the event, and nobody in the world knows who will win or what will happen. You see it for yourself, and thus share in the excitement of those who are actually present. There were two people who rarely welcomed television. The first were Wimbledon. Uh, they, of course, are always over-applied for the centre court and uh, Colonel Macaulay, who I saw last week, and he reminded me that they were the first people to welcome us, and they certainly did, and they thought they had nothing to lose whatsoever, that more and more people would take an interest in tennis and probably play better tennis as a result of seeing Wimbledon on television, and they proved absolutely right. And the other people were the Football Association, Stanley Rouse, now Sir Stanley Rouse. Uh, I'm afraid the Football League were very difficult. We could never get any football on ordinary Saturdays. But cup finals and the like, uh, to start with, of course, we were in black and white, and we couldn't see the ball in pretty low winter light. So I went to Stanley Rouse and I said, Look, don't you think we could have, is there any objection? Why don't we have a white ball? Very good idea, he said. And that's how the white ball started, which I'm now, between the two of us, has gone round the world. Now, hold it, Miss. On new camera one. A specialist commentator, who in this case would be a rowing man, adds to your and our enjoyment with an expert's description of the event. Tell you the crab is coming now, Oxford White, Oxford White, it's all out of our shadow. Good there it is. Oxford is one of these very big by three hour length and a half. The swim coming ashore now, so let's go over to the boat house and see the food coming in. Many viewers who previously took little interest in sport have awaited such broadcasts as these with the eagerness of the hardened enthusiast. One of the most exciting broadcasts was the outside broadcast from Epsom of the Derby, Guy Roussel's Derby in 1938. We went down the day before and we did a rehearsal. And I remember a little chap coming into the van and saying, tell me, can you see right across the course, right over there to the start, half a mile away? I said, yes, we've got marvellous lenses, we can see that. And he said, well, what will you cover? And I said, well, there'll be the tree on the left there, we can cover right, and just the starting gate on the right. Excellent, he said. He went away. Next day when we came, came we noticed Seeger's gin with the tree on the left and the end of gin on the, on the right. So uh, inadvertently, I couldn't get away from it. I had to do a very good bit of advertising for that particular enterprising firm. The famous fight between Boone and Danahard made television history, for like the 1938 and 1939 derbies, it was rediffused onto the large screens of several London cinemas. I'm taking a short rest while the referee comes, but he's up on six, and that's too soon, I think. And then he goes flat on his back again. We televised from dance halls. And not forgetting our women viewers, we took our cameras to fashion shows. Underneath is another telescopic swimsuit, this time in red, white, and yellow. Jean's leopard coat is particularly suitable for sportswear and point-to-point -point meetings. Under it, she has on a high neck dress in a tulip design of red, green, blue, white, and black. The first visit of the television cameras to the Victoria Palace to see Lupina Lane in Me and My Girl was so popular that it had to be repeated. <laughs> Like a 
Hawthorne violinist. Harry Haynes, a muffin man. You're looking at Colonel Hughes, DSO OBE, showing helmet of the British Cavalry Regiment. You're looking at Oliver Oldfield, who cleans London statues. The pattern usually was that people in uh, homes would have dinner, and about a quarter to nine, they would turn on the newly acquired television set and give it a quarter now to warm up, you see. And he would sit down with an air of expectancy, just as when you go to a theatre. We may as well understand one another before we go any further. I have not come here to be made a laughing stock. Now, repeat, please. Remember where you are and temper your hilarity with a modicum of reserve. Have you heard this one? Now, don't encourage me, you know, or I'm liable to out with something at any moment. Then who gets the blame? Well, I mean to say... This is a carving by the young English sculptor Henry Moore. It's a carving in wood. Moore is a Yorkshireman in his thirties, and he has a rapidly rising reputation among critics and connoisseurs. I might meet you around half past three, go to the club to have some sit. But to take you out to the house with me... Oh, I couldn't do a thing like that. I might go strolling through the park and let you kiss me for a lark. But strange things happen in the dark. So I couldn't do a thing like that. He says when he takes me out that he ought to love me like a brother. But if he don't stop some things, why I'll just have to tell my mother. He's a deaf and dumb, I heard. Talks with his hands, but it seems absurd. Last night he thought of a brand new word. And I'm afraid I kind of fell for that. Now, Miss Kilpatrick, will you show the later steps of the natural turn? Yes. Shall I do it on the chart? Yes, it's much clearer. Right. Left foot back onto point two. Right foot to the side onto point six. Close left foot to right foot. Right foot forward onto point nine. do a dancing act, rather in the style of um, Esther and Rogers, but with a lot of lifts. And we used to do it in cabaret and theatre. And then finally, we asked to do it for television. By a little agent who uh, told us we were wasting our time on television. <laughs> he said it won't mean anything more than one of those things on the pier that you turn a handle and watch. And we said, no, it's going to be one day we'll have thousands of viewers, thousands. And he roared with laughter. Well, I remember one day, we'd just been doing a cabaret show, and we came up to Ali Pali to do our act there. And uh, I was all dressed up and waiting to go on, and I thought I'd have a look and see what was going on in the studio. And I looked through the little porthole, and there was a girl who was really dancing very well and i said to my partner come and have a look this girl really is rather good it was margot fontaine well we needed a lot of help and this wonderful woman lillian bailey's she rang up and she said i have a ballet company an opera company and a drama company can we help you and I said, well, it's a wonderful offer. We like your ballet. And so we had 13 Vic Wells ballets. I was sitting in my office, nine o'clock at night, uh, working on schedules ahead, etc., quite quietly, and I had moved my office at that time right up to the very top of the palace in the fifth floor. When the phone rang, and a very flat voice said, uh, Mr. Madden, the Emperor of Abyssinia is here to see you. And I thought, good heavens, what 
does he mean? So I said, just say that again. He said, Mr. Madden, the Emperor of Abyssinia is here to see you. So I said, all right, I'll come down. So in a, in a sort of a sweat, I ignored the lift, rushed down the stairs to the bottom, ra ran out into the hall, and to my astonishment, there were about 16 people there, all in Ethiopian clothes. There was the king himself, Haile Selassie, Emperor of Abyssinia, Lion of Judah. There were two or three others looking rather like him, only bigger, and a host of children. So I said, uh, Your Majesty, uh, very pleased to welcome you here. Um, not a flicker passed on anybody's faces at all, no, not a response. So I tried the whole thing again in French. Not a flicker from anybody, etc. Then he made a gesture as if to say, cut the cackle, let's do something. So uh, the lift isn't very big. So in two or three goes, we managed to get everybody up onto the floor where the studios are, which, as you know, is two or three floors up, etc. And I was coming along the passage. Now, we used to employ a small boy in page boy uniform entirely to guard the gates of Studio A and B to prevent people going in. The boy was so overwhelmed at seeing me coming along with this enormous profession, he thought his job was to open the doors. So he banged them all open, right in the middle of a play, etc., and the entire party walked in. It was unexpected. Nobody had rung up. Nobody had said anything. But luckily, we were able to do the honors of the place, etc. And so I said goodbye. never thought about it anymore. My God, four days later, they did exactly the same thing all over again. Going on, sir. And now, for the next two minutes, we're going to show you a cartoon film. <laughs> you're having trouble with the film industry. They'll let you have newsreels, but they won't let you have anything else. Now, I will. He said, I'll give you as many Mickey Mouse as you want. And we use them all the time. Well, in 1936, I and the rest of the family were operating a small puppet show, which we used to do for parties and things all over the country. And uh, at that time, there was an exhibition by the British Puppet and Model Theatre Guild at Victory House, Leicester Square. And we used to go down there every evening. And the TV people asked for a sort of mixed show to put on television, puppets, glove puppets, the lot. And we did uh, just two or three of our items, of which this was one. Now, this is a scrapbook that my father kept over the years. This is the artist's impression of the studio, and as far as I can recall, there was, at the far end of it, a sort of glass-fronted office where the people worked who put on the music for us. They had a rather unfortunate habit of putting the music on in the wrong order, so we used to try and keep at least three lots of dogs ready so that whichever one they started with, we could snatch up the dogs for that one, because it all went out live. You couldn't... You couldn't go back. Once you'd started, you had to go on. And here was a centre page spread from the Radio Times, which appeared in February 37. It shows my father with his dolls, and this musical item, which was really our best item and the one we were, one we were known for. Radio. 
Carroll was at a very, very high level of quality and output in the 30s. Television was new, a totally new means of communication. And radio was suspicious, jealous, and I think quite sincerely thought it was unnecessary. Everything uh, came from Broadcasting House. And so if you were rung up on the telephone, it was uh, the bookings. Miss Helen Hewitt was the one, I think, in a charge in those days. And she would uh, say, Mr. Devlin, are you free on such and such a time? And then she would say, I'm afraid it's only television. Because uh, television fees were only at that time, I think, two thirds of the ordinary broadcasting fee. And uh, so she was always a little tentative and had to explain that it was only television. They didn't like uh, what was going on at Alley Pally. It was outside their realm altogether. They had very little control over it, fortunately, because we had to get on with what we were doing. There was no good waiting for memos to come up from uh, Broadcasting House. It had to be done now and urgently now. Now, of course, it was a complete change for the corporation and not a very welcome thing at the time. I mean, in the, in the play department, uh, the head of drama was horrified at the number of plays we were doing, which very much affected his routine for his year's programs, that sort of thing. They didn't like it. Soon, programs began to take on a definite pattern, and the Sunday night play was established. Tips like a harrow. The kid. A harrow's been sighted outside. Gee, I didn't think he'd come back. He's inside. Angelo, if I miss him, you'll get him. But I want everything piano, piano. Piano. Pianissimo. <laughs> Avanti. Hello, Spike. I'm quite sure that that recreation was sincerely done. But I remember, it's years since I've seen it now, of course, but I re do remember quite clearly thinking, I'm terribly sorry, it wasn't like this. Would I be going out? Great acting between 36 and 39 at Alexander Palace, and very fine actors. In, incidentally, very good plays. An author who very much took us up, I'm glad to say, at the time, was J.B. Priestley. We did about 16 of his plays. He wrote one specially for us called Whitehall Wonders. And he came up occasionally to tea and he would say things like, uh, you know, there's a play of mine called Bees on the Boat Deck. We knew it perfectly well. It had been in Shaftesbury Avenue. And he said uh, people didn't run very well at the time, but I think you could get Ralph Richardson to do it. Shall I speak to him? And then he spoke to him, and he did do it. It was a marvellous two-studio production of Shakespeare's The Tempest, with the young Peggy Ashcroft as unforgettable Miranda. She was marvellous. And George Devine, later to become famous at the Royal Court, played Caliban beautifully. When it was the, uh, uh, the close-up, you felt this huge thing rolling up to you there until it was about that distance from your face and the cameraman was only about two foot away from that and through his earphones you could hear perfectly clearly all the loud instructions from the control room and so you heard you know uh, uh, cut off his ears don't mind the top of his head get in closer closer while you were saying ah oh, dear Juliet or whatever it might be and don't forget everything was live 
there was no recording of methods available. Nothing was structured, artificial. For good or ill, it happened. Perhaps if you were, you know, playing a, a scene, uh, a fairly close scene with somebody else, and they wanted, uh, this would be in shot, and then they wanted uh, close-ups of both of you. The close-up camera would come in on Madam, and as soon as you were out of shot, somebody would give you the office from behind, and you would drop to the ground and crawl on hands and knees about three or four yards away to the other side of the studio where your own camera was, which you rose in front, and then close up of her, close up of you, and the uh, passionate interview was played with um, your back to your partner and about uh, three or four yards in between you. My generation are largely unrepentant about the loss, not the gain, that has come about through the attempt to make great feature film epics of plays and so on, instead of communicating the tension and emotion of a live actor doing his nut at that moment for an individual viewer. It was dynamite. I'm going to play this damn thing all night. Even a corny play. There were two schools of thought from 36 to 39. One is that there would be a war, and the other school of thought is that there wouldn't be a war. But if you think it out, both lots said, let's spend our money. So London was packed with cabarets. Baby, baby, let the dinner dishes go and follow, follow the crowd. Need Harlem dining more. Baby, baby, leave the milk and butter out and hustle, just bustle along so you can shout. Every hotel, the Barclay, the Ritz, the Qualinos, anywhere you like, they all had acts which could be bought quite cheaply at the times we wanted because they did their night shows very, very late, say at 11 and 1, whereas we wanted them at 9 p.m. so that the girls and the shows could come to Alexandra Palace, rehearse during the day, relax. They knew the show anyway, you see. And then we would do them at about 9 p.m. and they would go back in their coaches to London. Everybody would have a little pocket money. Both outside broadcast and film cameras were set up at Heston Airport when Mr. Neville Chamberlain came back from Munich. In September 38, uh, we heard that Chamberlain, then Prime Minister, uh, was coming back from negotiating with Hitler as to whether there was going to be war over, over the Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia. And so I quickly heard that the OB vans were available. I got in touch with the authorities through Philip Daughty, who was my boss in charge of OBs and films. And the next morning, we bowled down Great West Road with the OB vans to Heston. And already then, the people were crowding down the pavements in order to welcome him back. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Thank <laughs> you. 
the war had been imminent all too long, and it really looked as though it was coming. And we had this demonstration of the first ACAC battery run mainly by amateurs. And they came up to Alexander Palace to show how it was and how lucky and safe we would be with his 3.7 guns all around us in London. And they arrived, and a tremendous thing going on with searchlights. And the RAF wouldn't play, but we got a private plane from one of the uh, companies to have them actually to fly overhead uh, and uh, take the part of the raiding enemy. Everything was fine, and we had everything assembled, and we started out. Very uh, good background noise, good film background, good noise, good sound, good everything. Tremendous bangs from the guns, but they never seemed to be uh, aiming at where the aeroplane had just been. They were going the other way somehow. Eventually, the aeroplane decided it ought to play ball, so it kept on coming back for more. And the banging and the cursing and the noise that went on, terrific. Very, very good impression of a night barrage, but not a sign of the aeroplane being hit or even taken any notes. Eventually, it got tired and disappeared altogether. And when we'd finished the program, we looked up, the place was covered in blood. Everybody had caught their elbows or their ears or some part of their anatomy in the breaches of the guns. <laughs> it was really absolute. And I thought, looking back, I thought at that time, I wonder if we're going to win this war, you know, if it does come. Frighten me to death. Have you tried your new gas masks yet? Here they are. Aren't they moms? Three and eleven, three girls? The only trouble is, when you try and talk through the blow and suck department here, it makes the most immoral noises. But still, there it is. We shall all have to wear them. Father will still go to work, catching the 815, walking down the road, saying goodbye to mother. <laughs> and the flapper, she'll still flap as of yaw. Yes, and if she wants to give the glad eye, she'll do it with her windscreen wiper. Well, by late August, it was quite obvious that war was imminent inevitable. And on the morning of September the 1st, 1939, I was at Alexander Palace, and the director, Gerald Cox, was at Broadcasting House, and I got a message about 10 o'clock saying, close down television at noon and send the staff away as, as a rain. Well, this is very difficult to bear. I am told that I walked around the station <coughs> at about half past 11, and of an acid like place. I went to the various groups of engineers and others who were at their positions and <coughs> transmitting. And what we were actually doing was transmitting a film of Mickey Mouse at the time. And I simply said to them, the end has come. At noon, close it all down, go away to your rainy places. When war did come during the 1939 Radio Olympia, the shutdown of television was so sudden that not even a closing down announcement was made following this final Walt Disney Mickey Mouse cartoon. Your picture show was fine. It's a hit, it's a hit. And we want to shake your hand. Congratulations. Happy day to you. You've sure gone down the house. And we hope you have a lot of success. Congratulations. Mickey. And so television closed. But it was not to be forever. Thus, rather fulfilling a promise of Sir Isaac Sandberg, the eminent EMI director of the search, who uh, shortly after the open in 1936 had said to me, Mr. Birkinshaw, we have lighted a candle which will not readily be put out.
interesting, in the middle of the war, I ran into uh, Lord Swinton, who had been the Air Minister. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm in radar. And he said, well, what were you doing before? I said, I was in television. And he said, well, you know, the two are connected because we started the first public se service television in the world because we had to have the production capacity for the cathode ray tubes which we wanted for a radar, which is highly a secret, desperately confidential. We didn't want it to leak out. So we used the excuse of a public television service to get the manufacturing capacity. And that's why we were ready, and that's why we won the Battle of Britain. Just draw Conjured up in sound and sight by the magic ring. 